morning, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last, uh, last week, I was able to watch Harry at first service. I, I love Harry. He's a blessing to have come share with you guys. It's interesting to me when I have someone teach for me if I'm away, I don't tell them what to teach. I just, hey, whatever God lays on your heart. And I thought it was a very fit word just in season. So it was a blessing. Um, it is Palm Sunday. Talk about that a little bit, but let's pray. And I have some interesting articles for you. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask you would be with us. We pray, Lord, our hearts would be open to you. What exciting times we're living in, Lord. Even just one generation before us, the church longed to understand and see some of the things that are happening right in front of us. We pray that we would have hearts to discern the times. Be with us, Lord, and stir us and encourage us in our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Two quick articles. I want to put this on the recording today because they're interesting. One coming from WorldNet Daily, uh, March 27th, 2017, title, Stunner, UN to Plan Mark for World Population. If you believe the Bible is true, then you know it's going to happen. The, quote, Mark of the Beast, unquote, is a staple prophecy, a development many evangelical Christians would take as a sign the end times have truly begun. And Pastor Carl Gallup's believes there are real concrete indications that the United Nations has already started making preparations to develop the very technology that could be used to register every single person on earth. He sounds the warning in his latest book, When the Lion Roars, understanding the implications of ancient prophecy. He cites a report from the UN's 2030 agenda, including a list of 17 global goals. One of the goals is, quote, legal identity for all, including birth registration, unquote. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is also working to implement biometric technology to identify and track refugees. The information will be stored in a central database in Geneva, Switzerland. Such a plan could be expanded to include the global population. When asked if he was saying <clears throat> the United Nations, excuse me, was going to register the entire population, Gallup said these are not his words, but those of the United Nations. Quote, I don't make that prediction, but the UN has stated in, it, in its Agenda 2030, he said, and in my book I quote from the UN Agenda, and we know the Bible speaks in the last days, there's going to be some kind of marking system. So that's interesting. This also came out yesterday, I believe, or day before. This is pretty uh, exciting. This coming from Y, letter Y, Ynet News, it's an Israeli news source, ynetnews.com, quote, Muslims clear the Temple Mount, unquote. The Temple Mount movement, which is working on building the third Jewish temple, is asking Muslims not to come to the compound so as to allow Jews to sacrifice on the eve of Passover. A video that will be published in the coming days by the Temple Mount movement, which is working for the rights of Jews on the Temple Mount and aspires to build the third Jewish temple, is asking Muslims to evacuate the compound this coming Monday to allow the performance of a Passover sacrifice. On Monday, April 10th, we, the Jewish people, are commanded to perform a special sacrifice on the Temple Mount. Over the years, the Jewish people have been looking forward to the moment when they would be able to renew this mitzvah. So please evacuate the Temple Mount compound on this day to allow the Jewish people to perform the Passover sacrifice in its rightful time and place, said Raphael Morris in Arabic. In a conversation with Ynet on Tuesday, Morris rejected the claim that his intentions were fanning the flames. Quote, whoever wants to do this, perform a sacrifice, will do it. No matter what we say, our goal is to make the Temple Mount a place of brotherhood among all and, bring a, and build sorry, a Jewish temple. We ask them to evacuate the mountain to fulfill one of the most serious commandments in the Torah. It is possible and realistic. Last week, the Jerusalem district commander, Yoram Havlevi, prohibited the holding of a rehearsal of the Passover sacrifice event at the foot of the Temple Mount. At the event, they had planned to slaughter a sheep on an altar and then roast the lamb on coals. The organizers petitioned the High Court of Justice against Halivi and Police Commissioner Ron, um, Ash, Ron, Ronnie, it's just easier, <clears throat> demanding that the police decision be canceled, but on Sunday, they were both rejected. So they're working right now to get the right to go up there and sacrifice on the Temple Mount. Guess we'll all be tuning in on Monday. 
Yes, we are still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You're thinking, wow, you were gone for a week and we were gone for a week and you're exactly where we left you. Yeah, that's all right. We're going to move on today. So, But it's Palm Sunday. Yep, we'll get to that too. Don't worry. Again, Father, open your word to our hearts, we pray. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, detailed. The Lord will come from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Chapter 1, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one event, the return of Christ to the earth. And, verse 1. By our gathering together unto him. We've already learned that. First Thessalonians, the Lord will descend with a shout. We're going to be gathered to him in the air. But we beseech you that you be not soon shaken, troubled in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away, an apostasy first. And you let me know if you see any clues. And that man of sin, this Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, and who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, again, the naos, the actual temple itself, holy place, showing himself that he is God. Now, we've covered these things previously. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that is to restrain, to suppress, to quash, to hinder, to hold down. Now you know what withholdeth, that he, this Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, little side note, mysteries in the Bible are not things we cannot solve. They are things that have been previously hidden, but now are being revealed. The mystery of iniquity is already at work. Perhaps you're encountering that in your life too. Only he who now quashes, suppresses, hinders, holds down, he who now lets or restrains, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Again, God the Father on his throne, God the Son at his right hand, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father. He will send you another comforter, even the Holy Spirit. And John 14 there, 15 and 16, and he will be with you. He will be with you forever. We were given the Spirit of God. That Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost. The church, this new and unique relationship with God. Jesus told Nicodemus about it. You must be born again by the Spirit in your heart through faith in Christ. And that Spirit of God, he dwells in us. He will be with us and he will abide with us forever. But that witness of God is going to be removed. And that restraining work of the Spirit is going to be removed. And I'll talk more about that as we work through our text and how that looks. He will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And verse 8, don't miss this. And then, then shall that wicked, that Antichrist, be revealed. Pop quiz, how is he revealed? He makes peace agreement. All right, good. Everybody's still with me. I haven't lost it in two weeks. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, that is Revelation 19, when he returns, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, again, Revelation 19, when he returns, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, this Antichrist. We covered that, Revelation 13. There we saw this Antichrist rising in verse 2. The dragon, the devil, gave him his power, his seat, his authority. He was satanically empowered. We reminded you in Luke 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness there and being tempted by the devil, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I'll give this all to you, for it is mine to give to whoever I will. Never argued the point with him. And Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. So Satan now finally has his false Christ on the scene, and he will empower him. That's what's coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power, that word is dunamis in the Greek, the idea of inherent power, from which we get words like dynamite. With all power, signs, that is, events or miraculous things that bear significance, and lying, deceitful, wonders, and that is miracles or signs, false miracles, 
Satan is going to bring his own counterfeit with power, false miracles, lying wonders. I know what you're thinking. Why are signs so important? Aha, glad you asked. Left turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Left turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Why are signs so important? Well, Paul's preaching here, and he tells us in verse 22, 1 Corinthians, not 2nd, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require what? A sign. So what is Satan going to use to deceive them? Signs. By the way, how strong are these signs going to be? What did Jesus say? If it were possible, they would deceive who? The very elect, Matthew 24. Great, you guys have read that. These things are going to be serious deceptions. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, because they thought he would come and establish a kingdom. They missed what Jesus told us. First, the Christ must suffer. Then he will reign in glory. They missed it. They didn't understand. He's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, he's foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Amen. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Nice. So signs are important to the Jews. Turn to John 6, further left. Signs are important to the Jews. Okay. Jesus has fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. And he used what to feed them? Five loaves and two fish. Good, you've read the account. And when the people saw this, they began to say in John's gospel, hey, maybe, and they wanted to take him and make him king. So Jesus sent his disciples into the boat. They cross over the other side. Jesus joined them eventually. And how did Jesus join them? On foot across the Sea of Galilee. Everybody? Okay, good. And of course, you know how the account went. Well, the next day, verse 25, when they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, knowing the disciples had left without him, they said, Rabbi, when came us that? How'd you get here? And Jesus gave them again some answers. Verse 28, they said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered unto him, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. Well, as they burped up the fish and bread from the miracle the day before. Sorry, I added that just for sake of clarity because we're jumping in mid-text. They said to him, well, what sign will you show? Hey, there's that sign thing again. What sign will you show that we may see and believe as they're burping up yesterday's meal? Huh. Turn to Matthew chapter 12, further left. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 22. There was brought unto Jesus one possessed with a devil, blind and mute or dumb. As I told you before, according to historians, the Jews felt you had to, for delivering out a demon, get the name of a demon. And so if someone was mute, they felt that case was hopeless because they couldn't you know, ascertain the name and deal with the demon. So this would be a hopeless case to them. They would give up. There was brought to Jesus one possessed with a devil, blind and mute, and he healed him. Insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw... And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? That is a title for Messiah. Is not this the Messiah? But when the Pharisees, the religious leadership heard it, they said, this fellow cast out, not, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, satanic power. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, schools them on the fault of their logic. And verse 38, they said this, then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, master, we would see a sign from you. Wait a second. What did he just do in verse 22? Healed a hopeless case. You mean you can have signs in front of you and yet be too blind to see them? Yep. Okay, well, back to our text. So his coming, this Antichrist, is after the working of Satan. He will have power signs, lying wonders. Huh. 
If you remember Revelation 13, I won't make it turn there. After the Antichrist comes a false prophet. And that false prophet deceives the nations with the miracles he's able to do. And it says in Revelation 13, so that he even calls down fire from heaven. How many have read it, seen it for themselves? Okay, great. He even calls down fire from heaven. Now, if you're a casual reader of the Bible and you don't really pay attention, you might actually easily fall for that one. Why? Well, because back in Leviticus chapter 9, how many have heard of Moses? Great. How many are still awake? <laughs> Twice as many as know Moses. Just trying to make sure. Moses and Aaron set up the tabernacle, set up the altar, set up the sacrifice, put it on order, came out of the tabernacle, and the fire came from God, lit the thing. Interesting side thought. God lights the fire. You keep it burning. God lit the altar. Everybody falls on their faces. They start worshiping God. Solomon, 2 Chronicles 7, builds the first temple. After this amazing prayer, chapter 6, chapter 7, verse 1, he steps away and fire came down from heaven from God, lit the sacrifice again on the altar, and all the people again fall on their faces. Israel falls into a period of apostasy, divides into two kingdoms. In the north, they begin to worship Baal or Baal. Elijah finally has a challenge to the prophets of Baal and also Ahab, who's married to Jezebel. How many have heard of her? Right, you got a sense of the kingdom. And so he goes to Mount Carmel, faces down the 400 plus prophets of Baal. Mount Carmel's home turf for Baal. It's like the best place you could be to worship him. Here's our competition. You guys call on your God. I'll call on the true and living God, the God that answers the fire. He's God. They said, good, game on. They spent all day calling out the Baal, cut themselves, bleeding everywhere. Nothing happens. By the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah sets up the stones, sets out the sacrifice, has them pour water on it repeated times, digs a trench to make sure it's nice and wet, and then says, hear me, Lord, hear me, that they may know you're turning their hearts back to them. And fire came down from God and destroyed the sacrifice, the wood, burned up the stones, the dust, the water, everything. And the people fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God. Second Kings chapter one, Elijah, still prophet. Now Ahaziah, the wicked son of Jezebel and Ahab, is sick. Long story short, wants to interrogate Elijah. So he sends a captain with a host of 50 to go get Elijah. And he says, you man of God, Come down here. We want to talk to you. The king wants you. He said, if I be a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and devour you all. Boom, all 50 gone. The king going, where are they? Sends another captain of 50 with 50. They pass the charred remains of their first host. Come, you man of God, come down. If I be a man of God, let fire come up. Boom, second host gone. So they send a third captain of 50 with 50. Who said, pass the first burnt set of remains, pass the second burnt set of remains, says, you guys stay here. Goes up on his knees, breaks out a family photo. Hey, look, man, I got a family. Can, you know, could you come down? Basically, it's what he did. And then God told him, okay, you can go with him. Why all that? Because Jezebel's still alive. But again, the fire from heaven was from God. Revelation 11. Two prophets, we learned about them, going through Jerusalem, Jerusalem, three and a half years. They call that, anybody wants to hurt them, the fire comes from their mouth, whether it's called down or comes out, we'll find out. But fire comes down, it's a judgment of God to get rid of those who seek to hurt them. They can smite the earth with plagues, turn water to blood. So there are two genuine prophets who call down fire. Now, if that's all you ever read, you would say anytime fire is called down from heaven, it's God. But there's one case where it wasn't, and that's in the book of Job. And in Job chapter 1, by the way, he who restrains, here's an interesting illustration. Satan comes before the Lord. You know the dialogue happens. If you consider my servant Job, while well, he does, he fear God for nothing. You put a hedge of protection around him. You pull that back, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, you can touch anything he has, but you cannot touch him. So that restraint was pulled back a little. Satan went out, destroyed his flocks, crops, you name it, all kinds of stuff. And it says, and the fire came down from God and destroyed one of his flocks. Now, this time it's satanic activity allowed by God. Satan comes back. Job didn't curse God. He lost. You know what happens? Chapter 2, Satan says, skin for skin. You touch him, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, pulls the restraint back a little further. You can touch him, but you must spare his life. Who's really in control? God. And if you've read the book of Job, you know what happened to him. He who restrains will restrain till he's taken away. Then shall that lawless one who is empowered by Satan, who has his own agenda, finally be allowed to have free reign. This world has never seen that kind of world yet where there's unrestrained evil, completely unrestrained. 
What's coming is horrible. And it will be with lying signs and wonders. I know what you're thinking. You know, I think I'd rather be up with the kids right now making palm branches, singing, here comes Jesus riding on a donkey, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, which is a great song, by the way. Because they're going to get in the car and, you know, Daddy, what'd you learn about? Well, Palm Sunday, we learned about the Antichrist. (laughs) We're not finished. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. By the way, if there are lying signs and wonders, what does that mean also? There are true signs and wonders. Okay. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, once again for the record, notice them, they, their, as opposed to we, you, us. Pay attention. It's important. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them... That perish. Why do they perish? Because they, they, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They received not the love of the truth. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, it is Palm Sunday which means you need to go to Luke 19.41. Left turn. Luke 19.41. You know what's happened. Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives, going from Bethany and Bethphage, heading down the Mount of Olives. Very seldom do you see Jesus orchestrate an event. He takes two of his disciples, go into this village, you'll find a donkey and a colt. Loose them, bring them to me. You know what he told them to do. They brought them to Jesus. They put garments on him. They set him on them. And they began to descend the Mount of Olives. They ripped down palm branches to lay him in front of them, laid their garments in front of them, giving him, quote, the royal treatment, treating him as a coming king. As they're coming down, the people begin to bust out and praise, verse 38, saying, Blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees, as was said during worship from among the multitude, said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones, creation itself, would immediately cry out. And when Jesus was come near, verse 41, he beheld the city and he wept. Not just cheerful, he sobbed. He wept over it. And you got a great view when you come down the Mount of Olives. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, hold on to that, the things which belong unto thy peace, But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench round about thee and compass thee round and shall keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou did not know the time of your visitation. What time? Well, to understand that, we need a few more signs. Go to Zechariah, just after Matthew. Keep going left. Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah. Chapter 9. What signs are they talking about? What time of visitation is he talking about? What does he mean? Zechariah 9, verse 9. This coming hundreds of years before it happened. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, try a Hosanna, for example. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon the colt, the foal of a donkey. How will King Messiah enter? On a donkey. Okay, keep going left. Well, how will we know it's him? Go to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, further left. Isaiah 35, 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. Your God will come and save you. Your king will be meek and lowly, having salvation. Your God will come and save you. 
Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap as the deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall see. Now on your way back, stop at Daniel chapter 9. This is Palm Sunday, Daniel chapter 9. Again, if you've read the chapter, Daniel's crying out, knows the time of captivity is coming to a close, begins to intercede on behalf of his nation. Gabriel shows up and gives him this understanding. Verse 24, 70 sevens, seven-year periods, are determined upon thy people, the Jews, upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Six things will be accomplished. One, finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity. That is the first time the Christ comes when he suffers. Second set of three, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to complete or seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy on the throne of David. That is the second coming of Christ. Here you have it right in verse 24. First, the Christ will suffer, then he'll enter his glory. Verse 25, know therefore and understand, here it is, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, not the temple, Jerusalem, until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, 69 seven-year periods. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. When Cyrus defeated the Babylonians, he allowed them to go and build the temple. That's not what we're talking about here. This is rebuilding the walls and the gates. And there was a man who had a heart for Israel. He was working in another country. He asked how things were going in Jerusalem. The men who came back said, not good. The people are demoralized. We're defenseless. It's, it's, the work is slow. It's just horrible. And he was so brokenhearted about it that he began to pray and to fast and to seek God for months. And he went into work one day, and his heart was just burdened with what was going on. And as he was there, his employer, who, by the way, happened to be a king, said, why are you sad? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. That can be a life-ending issue for him. He could be sad because there's a coup. He could be sad because someone poisoned the cup and they're threatening him. He has to drink it and then give it to the king. There's lots of reasons he could be sad. That could be life ending. So he quickly said, how could I not be sad when the city of my father's lies in ruins and the gates are burned with fire? And the king, the queen sitting beside him also said, well, then what do you ask? And he said, I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, let me go back and rebuild the city. Let me go back and put up the walls again. And he said, well, how long will you need? And so I set the king an appointed time. And I asked that letters would be written to the governors, to Tatna and others across the river, so that they might give me the materials needed to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city. That man's name was Nehemiah. And that king was, Ahaz was Artaxerxes. Not Artaxerxes. That king was Ahasuerus. Oh, come on, brain. Artaxerxes. That king was Artaxerxes. And that decree happened on March 14th, 445 B.C. That was when the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. You add 69 seven-year periods. Yeah, 69 seven-year periods. You get 483 years. The calendar they were using was the Babylonians. That was a 360-day year calendar. You add 173,880 days to March 14th, 445 BC. Sir Robert Anderson in his work says, you get, think of the time of year, April 6th, 32 AD, that the Messiah will enter Jerusalem. And how should he enter? On a donkey. How will you know it's him? Eyes of the blind, ears of the deaf, mute will speak, lame will walk. By the way, look at Daniel 9.26. And after this time, Messiah will be executed. Look at Daniel 9.26 again. And those people will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Look at Daniel 9.27. And in the future, a false Christ will come. Palm Sunday is the presenting to the world of God's son. In fact, of God himself coming meek and lowly, riding on a donkey, having salvation. And this is how blind they were. Now go to Matthew 21 as we head back. Matthew 21. Again, Jesus rode in. They were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Bring you back up to speed of what we were studying. 
As he was coming to Jerusalem, verse 10, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, chapter 21, And Jesus went into the temple, cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. By the way, if you know the Mount, Temple Mount, just below the mount, off in a corridor, they had shops. They didn't have to put it in the court of the Gentiles. They had corrupted worship. And he said to them, it is written, my house should be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Look at this. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them after just getting off a donkey. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Let me translate. <clears throat> save now to the Messiah. Your God will come and save you. He'll come on a donkey with salvation. Hosanna to the son of David. When they saw this, they were sore displeased. And they said to Jesus, do you not hear what they say? And Jesus said to him, yes. And have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? Wait a minute, time out. Who does praise belong to? God. How many just had an epiphany? Yes. And have you not read that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you've perfected praise to God as he's there? And Jesus left the city, went out to Bethany, and he lodged there. That is why he said, if you knew this your day, the things that belong to your peace, but now they're hid from your eyes because their hearts were hard because you did not know the time of your visitation. Palm Sunday was the time God visited Israel and offered salvation. That's what Palm Sunday is. Back to our text. Nice. So since they have rejected the true, and I won't make you turn there, but remember we learned that in Zechariah 11, smite the shepherd, scatter the sheep. I said to them, weigh my price for what you prize me of. And they gave me 30 pieces of silver and they cast it in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> and they bought the potter's field. That's Zechariah 11. And it went further in Zechariah 11. Because you've rejected the true, God will raise up a coarse, an idle shepherd who will destroy the flock. That's what's coming. So with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, verse 10, chapter 2, in them that perish. Why do they perish? Because they receive not the love of the truth, even in spite of all the evidence God gave them. They receive not the love of the truth. What would it do for them? That they might be saved. For this cause, what cause? That they received not the love of the truth. God shall send them, not us, not you, them. Strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they might all be krino in the Greek, to discriminate, this is in a right way, that is to judge between good and evil, to separate, to discriminate or judge between them, that they might be damned or judged. Why? Who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you remember when Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth there and he sat in the synagogue, they gave him the scroll of Isaiah, <clears throat> Luke chapter 4, he opened it up and he read, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, opening the prison doors, and all that. And he stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. Rolled it up and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. And they said, oh, really? And they threw him out. This is the end of the acceptable year of the Lord. When this strong delusion comes, this is now the beginning of the day of judgment of our God. When he's revealed this antichrist. But don't you love verse 13? <sighs> but we note the change. We, you, us, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning. Question, where does that start? Well, in the beginning. Yeah, nice. Okay, good. But you remember the math books with the railroad tracks trying to show you infinity going off like into the end of your page and you kind of go, remember that? Where does it start? God has always known you. You may not know him, but he knows you. 
You may not love him, but he loves you. Yeah, prove it. Fine. We'll study that next week on the cross. He knows you, but do you know him? Because he is going to separate sheep from goats. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen, that's horeo, to take to oneself. He's chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit. That's where God takes off the old man we used to be, turns us into the new man and new woman we should be. How many of you got to experience sanctification the last week like me? Anybody else? Liars, you just got sanctified. We're always being challenged by God. It's a lifelong thing till we're gone. Through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you. It's his dime. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Isn't that interesting? He called you, they received not. Do you know him? Well, pastor, I don't know if I believe in Jesus, and maybe that's my whole problem. Maybe God never called me. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. You ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You believe God raised him from the dead. You confess Jesus with your mouth as your Lord. The Bible says you will be saved. Titus 3. And the way you'll prove that faith is now produce good works. Change how you used to live to now how you should live. Let God change that in you. That'll prove to us that confession you made was genuine. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, then you know what? Maybe he didn't call you. Well, Pastor, you know, that's not fair. You know you're right. Tell you what. You receive Christ in your heart by faith. You confess him with your mouth as your Lord and your Savior. You allow his spirit to sanctify you and change you so that you begin to produce good works and you will be saved. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, then you're right. Maybe you're not called. Where's the problem? Not with God. They received not the love of the truth. They chose. And man, it's a big choice. Well, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, you, we, us, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you've been taught. Don't cave in in this world. And they were being persecuted, remember? I know it's a long time ago since we started this book, but they were being persecuted. Stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, which now are to us, the apostles' doctrine, our epistles and our gospels, Hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and given us, note the us versus them. How many caught that on their own? None of you. <laughs> loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Nice. Comfort your hearts. Wait a minute. I know it's been a while, but let's put this together. Why do their hearts need to be comforted? Oh, back in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Because they were shaken, troubled, because they heard that the day of Christ, that day of judgment has already come, is present or at hand. Comfort your hearts. Why? Because there's going to be a falling away first. The man of sin is going to be revealed. And you were chosen to salvation. Now that goes back to the first letter. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Look, you don't have to agree with me. Go, but study it for yourself. How could we be comforted if we know we're going to get shellacked? Interesting. The day has not yet come. And the idea here, in my opinion, is, and you who believe will not suffer through it. You go study for yourself. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And the church fainted saying hallelujah because we finally finished <laughs> chapter two. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray for those, Lord, who have not received the love of the truth, whether they're watching or they're here listening. 
Can't think of a better week to finally open our hearts and our eyes to you than the week of your passion, where you laid it all out for us. On a Friday as we gather, Lord, that garden where you surrendered everything, your son laid it all down, and you gave him up so the wrath of God could be placed on him instead of us. Lord, how I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. May the Spirit of God so call them in their heart that they finally surrender to you. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Strengthen us for the week ahead. Give us open doors to talk about the hope we have in Jesus. And thank you, Lord. It's good to be your bride. You're the best groom ever. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.